Take your Bibles this morning. We're not going to be real long today, but Matthew 7, verse 13. This is the words of Jesus. Now listen carefully to what Jesus says. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life. And few there be that find it. Boy, those are some powerful words, aren't they? You know what Jesus is saying? This is totally contrary to most people's thinking. Jesus is saying, the road to heaven is narrow. The, great is, uh, the gate is narrow. Few people will make it to heaven. But you know what most people think? Well, most people go to heaven. When Frank Sinatra died, there was a little cartoon of Frank Sinatra. You know how he used to put his coat over his shoulder? And it showed him into going into the gates of heaven. And it says, he did it his way. Well, nobody gets to heaven their way. You've got to come Christ's way. But the truth is, most people think, well, everybody's gone to heaven. Everybody that dies is going to heaven. Most people, now listen to me, most people do not go to heaven. Only a few people go to heaven. And so that contradicts the thinking of most people. As a matter of fact, Jesus taught that there is a hell, that it's real. It ought to break our hearts. It ought to sadden us. It ought to make us want to do everything we can to, to try to keep people from going there. But it says many people are going to go to hell. Most people will die and go to hell. Few people will go to heaven. You know, there's only two kinds of people in this room today. There's only two kinds of people in the world. There are saved people and there are lost people. There are children of God and children of Satan. They are friends of God and enemies of God. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. And a lot of people would be surprised if you knock on their door and say, do you know you're an enemy of God? Well, no, I'm not an enemy of God. But the truth is, if they've never been born again, never been saved, they're an enemy of God. You say, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? Well, let me ask you this. How could a holy God defile heaven and allow sin into heaven? Richard Nelson's not here today, but I, I went to a Bible study and heard him teach. He did such a wonderful job of explaining salvation. And he said, it's like going into this house, and the guy who lives in the house is so clean, and everything about that house is clean, and there's only one door into that house. By the way, what is the door to the house? Jesus is the door. And he said, <coughs> the only thing is this guy's dirty. His shoes are dirty. His clothes are dirty. If he goes into this beautiful, clean house, he's going to mess it up. So you know what? He can't go in. He can't go in until he gets clean. Does anybody here know what will clean you of sin? Jesus will. He shed his blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Well, Brother Carl, I want you to know I do a lot of good stuff that won't cleanse you. I give a lot of money to help people. I give to the church. I give to all kinds of things. That's not going to help you a bit. You still got, you got dirty feet. You still can't go in. And so, this morning, I want to talk to you briefly about the people who will not be able to go to heaven. I've got five kinds of people. I could, you could talk about six or seven of them, but I stopped at five. But I want to talk to you about people who will not go to heaven. Number one, if you're taking notes, number one, the self-righteous will not go to heaven. Now there's a story in Luke 18 verse 9. It says that he spoke a parable of some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Can you think of a more hated man than a tax collector? I can't. I tell you, I've got, got to do my taxes and I ain't looking forward to it. It's going to be a depressing 
pressing thing that I'm going to write them a check. But I do, I do appreciate my country, and I've got soldiers that are fighting. And there are some things I don't mind paying for. I don't want to pay for every little entitlement to people. By the way, let me just say, can I throw this in? Well, uh, our, our Congress just passed one of the largest entitlement programs in history. But let me say this. No man is entitled to another man's money. No man is entitled to another man's money. If you want a service, pay for it. Don't expect other people to pay for your services, but that's not the way we live nowadays. We're expecting somebody to take care of us and, and all. But anyway, these men went to pray, and the Pharisee said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this old publican over here, this tax collector. I thank you that I go to church every Sunday. I thank you that I tithe 10% of my income. I thank you, Lord, that I am such a good moral person. And then it says the tax collector prayed, and he wouldn't even look up to heaven. He just bowed his head and he said, Oh God, I'm a sinner. Be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Be merciful. You know what Jesus said? The second man went home justified, just as if he'd never sinned. In other words, the Pharisees uh, not saved. He, he didn't trust Christ. He trusted his own r- r- righteousness instead of trusting Jesus Christ. Being moral, being religious, fasting, giving, praying, that'll send you to hell. It'll send you to hell. A cheating tax collector, and that's what it meant. It meant some old tax collector that cheats people out of their money. But he humbled himself and asked God to cleanse him and forgive him, and he got saved. And guess where he's going? He's going to heaven. See, it doesn't make sense. We think, well, if you're really good, you'll go to heaven. Wrong. You only go to heaven if you're saved. And you can't save yourself. I don't care how hard you try. You can't cleanse yourself. You need Jesus. The Pharisee was blinded by an eye problem. He had an eye problem. He said, I tithe. I go to church. I help other people. I'm so good. I'm glad I'm not like this old guy over here. He had an eye problem. Let me tell you, the only reason I'm going to heaven... Is because of Jesus. There's nothing good about me. Yesterday we were at a funeral of a dear saint of God who went on home to be with the Lord. And I tell you, it was so good to hear the... Uh, it, it was a, it was rejoicing. There was laughter. They were talking about some of the fun. Let me tell you something. Death isn't a sad thing. If you're saved, it's a good thing. Death isn't the enemy. Death is my welcome friend. He's going to usher me into the arms of Jesus. One day God's going to say, Death, I want you to go down there and get Carl Ivins. He's been serving a long time. He's weary. Go get him. And death is going to grab me in his chilly arms, but I'm not going to feel a chill. When he comes, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be uh, angry because he is going to take me and place me in the arms of Jesus. And Jesus is going to touch my face, and my face is going to become a young man again. He's going to touch my head, and guess what? Hair is going to start growing all over. Not white hair either. I'm talking about a hair as dark as a raven's beak. I tell you, it's going to be fun. And He's going to touch my body, and these old feet that don't feel very, uh, very well and, and don't walk very steady, uh, man, I'm going to be able to run. And Jesus is going to say, look over there. Who's that over there? And there's my uncle, my aunt, my grandmother, my granddaddy. And he's saying, go on over there and sing to me a while. And we're going to get together and sing. Don't you think, I, man, I, I can't wait for that to happen. And that's what I have to look forward to. And that dear saint of God yesterday, the people just talking about her because she lived for Jesus all her life. Why, why won't people live for Jesus? Why, why, why do they say no to Jesus? It doesn't make sense. I can't think of a good reason. 
You think your goodness will get you to heaven, you're wrong. Ecclesiastes 7.20, There is certainly no righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Number two, second kind of people that will not go to heaven. Hypocrites will not go to heaven. Some people say, I don't want to go to church with a bunch of hypocrites, so you're going to go to hell with all of them? That don't make sense. Matthew 23, verse 13, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You lock up the kingdom of heaven from people. You know, that's what a hypocrite does. It turns people off. For you don't go in, and you don't allow those entering to go in. Woe unto you! Boy, Jesus was quite a preacher. He said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Jesus did not go to class at the new politically correct, don't offend, seeker-friendly. This is how you reach people by not, not saying you or pointing your finger, just being real nice and kind, and you'll get people to come back. Nope, that wasn't Jesus, was it? He said, you hypocrites. Wow. That's not how you build a big church. Jesus didn't care about a big church. He said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You, you devour widows' houses and make long prayers just for show. See, they love to pray and show how religious they were. This is why you have received a harsher punishment. You know what Jesus said? Hell's going to be worse for y'all. Hell will be worse for you. You say, what is a hypocrite? Some people say a hypocrite is a Christian Living like a devil. No, that's not what a hypocrite is. A hypocrite is a devil living like a Christian. Hypocrites, they can come to church. They can talk like Christians. They can walk like Christians. They can act like Christians. But deep down, they're as lost as a ball in high grass. They're on their way to hell. But they've learned how to fake it. A lot of people can't see it. We can't see the heart, but let me tell you something. God can. I remember years ago, church I was pastoring in Georgia. We had a young man get saved. Man, it was glorious. He got man. He got born again. It changed his life. He started coming, and his wife started coming, and they became very active in our church. As a matter of fact, both of them taught Sunday school. They came to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. If someone had said, what's some of the best people in your church? I'd have mentioned this couple. One day, I think we had a guest speaker. It might have been during a revival. And this guy's wife called me on the phone and said, Brother Carl, I've got to talk to you. I thought, that's strange. I said, well, come on by the office. She came by my office that Monday afternoon. Took off. took, Took half a day off of work said, I had to talk to you. I couldn't sleep last night. I said, what's wrong? She said, I'm not saved. I said, you're not? She said, no, I've been playing everybody. I've been tricking even my own self. I'm lost. I've never been saved. I know I'm teaching Sunday school. Everybody thinks I'm a good Christian. But she said, I'm lost. I need to get saved. And right there in my office, she got saved. In just a few Days later, she got baptized. And boy, I could tell a difference in her. I could tell a difference. As good as that woman was on the outside, there was something different about her when she got the inside cleaned up. Hypocrites will not go to heaven. Number three, head believers and not heart believers will not go to heaven. You said, Brother Carl, what do you mean by that? I believe a lot of people believe in Jesus in their head, but they never accepted Him in their heart. Listen to what the Bible says. James 2.19 says, You believe in God? You believe that He's one God? You do well. The demons also believe, and they shudder. There are demons that have more religion than than a lot of people. Because demons not only believe, but they tremble. They, they, They fear God. Some people do they don't fear God. No, he's just a man upstairs. He's my buddy. He's my pal. He won't send me to hell. No, he's a good guy. They don't know the real God. 
They don't know the real Jesus. John MacArthur has a book out, and I have not read it, but I like the title of it. And uh, I don't agree with everything John MacArthur teaches, but um, many things he does say that are good. And he, he has a book called The Jesus You Cannot Ignore. And most people do. Hollywood tries to paint Jesus as some little weak, sissy, meek person. But that's not the God of the Bible. That's not the Jesus that's in the Bible. And so there's a lot of people who say, sure, I believe in God. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. You know, the truth is, I believed in Jesus all my life. My mama taught me about Jesus. And I went to Sunday school a little bit, not much, but I went to Sunday school a little bit. I remember going to vacation Bible school when I was a little kid. And we sang songs like, Jesus loves me. And if somebody said, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I believe in Jesus. Do you believe He died on the cross? Yes, I believe He died on the cross. But I was as lost as could be because I've never trusted Him with my soul to take me to heaven. And when I was 18 years old, I heard the gospel and the Holy Spirit convicted me. I remember holding on to that pew during the invitation. Oh, there was a struggle in my soul. The Holy Spirit was wanting me to give my life to Christ and I didn't want to. I wanted to control my own life and I was saying no to Jesus and He was wanting me to come to Him. When I was 18 years old, I surrendered. I remember it was like, almost like, okay, Lord. And I went, whew. And I went forward in that church and a man came up to me and said, do you realize you're a sinner? And I said, oh yes, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a big sinner. I tell you what, when God gets a hold of you, you'll realize you're a sinner. You'll feel like you're the worst sinner in this world. That's what conviction does. See, when you're saying, well, you know, I'm not too bad. I'm better than most people. I'm as good as anybody else. Let me tell you something. You hadn't encountered God yet. Wait till the Holy Spirit comes upon you and convicts you and shows you You'll feel like the worst, dirtiest, wickedest sinner in the world. I don't care if you're a six-year-old kid. When conviction comes on you, that's what happens. And so it's not just believing in your head, it's believing in your heart. I remember hearing this story years ago. There was a tightrope walker. He walked on tight ropes, and he was, uh, his name was Blondin. And uh, he was with a family who did that, and... Uh, he walked across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. You know they, you know how they carry the pole. Now, when you do it outside, you got the wind. It's a lot more difficult. But he walked across, and he made it all the way across the Niagara Falls, and the people applauded, and they clapped. And then he turned to the people, and he said. How many of you believe I could walk across Niagara Falls on a tightrope carrying a man in a wheelbarrow? And the people began to clap and applaud, and many of them raised their hands and said, We believe you can. And he said, Who will volunteer? Who will volunteer? Nobody volunteered. They didn't really believe he could, did they? Because when you believe something, you'll act upon it. So you say, well, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I believe He died on the cross. Yeah, I believe He's the Son of God. But have you given Him your life? Have you trusted Him with your soul? If you haven't, you're lost. I could say, do you believe in parachutes? I believe in parachutes. Am I going to jump out of a plane in one? Nope. What would it take to get you to jump out of a plane? There ain't nothing you can offer that would make me do that. I ain't going to do it. Then you say, well, you believe in parachutes. I believe in parachutes, but I'm not willing with my life. That's the difference in being saved. You can believe in Jesus. You can believe He died on the cross. You can believe that He's the Son of God. But until you give Him your life, not a part of your life, all of your life, you're not saved. 
Those who continue in sin will not go to heaven. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-7 through Do you not know that the unjust will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. See, here he's saying, listen, don't be tricked. Because some people are deceived. No sexually immoral person. That means if you commit fornication, that's sex outside of marriage. You think you can live with someone in, in sin and go to heaven? You are wrong, my friend. God clearly commanded against... Can you say, Jesus is my Lord, I'm just not going to listen to what He says. Jesus is my King, but I'll do what I want to, not what He tells me. He's not your King. That's all talk. That's all it is. Idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, uh, revilers, swindlers... Do you think they'll inherit the kingdom of God? Some of you were like this, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. You know what? You can used to be one of these, but you can't be one now and go to heaven, not continue in it. You might stumble and fall, and God will forgive you. But if you just continually disobey God and don't even care, Jesus is not your Lord. Quit calling Him Lord. Quit saying, oh, I'm a Christian. I got my flu shot back when I was eight years old. I went down and signed a card with one of those pencils that doesn't have an eraser. So I must be going to heaven. I must be saved. No, it's not what you did. It's what, you, what, what who, who are you now? Are you in Christ Jesus? I remember back in the 70s when I was in Bible college, there was a woman who got saved. <coughs> she was a stripper. She, she used to uh, dance and take off her clothes before wicked, lustful men. And when she got saved, she quit stripping, didn't she? No, she said, you know what? I'm going to strip for Jesus. I'm going to be a, a Christian stripper. Stripper. I can't even say it. It's so weird to me. Can you believe that? Like somebody saying, I'm going to be a Christian, uh, you know, serial killer. You say, Brother Carl, I thought you said your works didn't get you to heaven. It doesn't. You get to heaven by faith and trusting Jesus. But I tell you, when Jesus gets a hold of you, He will change you. If a woman's a stripper and she gets saved, guess what? She'll find a new line of work. Years ago, they, I guess they're still around. Maybe one here in Nashville. I don't know. They were called homosexual churches. Can't be one. Can't happen. We're going to a church that is for homosexuals. It's a contradiction of terms. Now, I don't believe we need to be unkind to anyone, but I tell you what, you, you say, well, uh, people get mad and they won't come to your church and they may lock you up. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll be in jail, but I, this is what the Bible says I cannot comprehend. If you don't like what I'm saying, you don't like the Bible. If you don't like what I'm saying, you don't like God because God said it. Homosexual church... You see how the devil wants us to pull God down into sin and mire? And then last of all, and I'm going to close. <coughs> who will not go to heaven? Those who will not come to Jesus. What do you have to do to go to hell? Nothing. Really, you don't have to do anything. Just live your life, you'll wind up in hell. Why won't people come to Jesus? It doesn't make sense, does it? This wonderful life that God said, I'll give you. The peace and security of knowing that you're going to miss hell and go to heaven. Some people think I'm hard because I tell people they're going to hell. Now, I'll tell you who's really mean is the one that won't tell you. 
I tell you who the wicked one is, is Joel Osteen, who will just say, everything's nice and kind, and it doesn't matter, we're all just going to heaven. He believes in universalism. Let me tell you something. If I, it, that's as wicked as putting poison in your drink, because it is poison. It is a lie, and it's sending people to hell. I don't think you ought to talk about people. I tell you what, if they're trying to, to poison people, if somebody's trying to hurt your grandbaby, wouldn't you stop them? Wouldn't you warn against them? Wouldn't you stand up against them? So guess what? That's what I'm going to do. And it's poison. Well, you can get a big church that way. Just tell everybody God loves you and everything's wonderful and it don't matter what you do. And the Hindus and, and the... Uh, Muslims, and we're all going to one big place. We're just taking different roads. Yeah, they are going to one place, but it's not heaven. Oh, I'm a mean guy, I know, because I tell you the truth. And the truth is, if you don't repent of your sins, you will end up in hell. And I'm your best friend by telling you that. John 5, 39, verse 40 says, you pour over the Scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them. Yet they testify about me. And you are not willing to come to me that you might have life. Jesus saying, you're not willing to come to me. Here I have eternal life. But you won't come and get it. You reject me. You say no to me. Can you give me a good reason why someone would not come to Jesus? I mean, right now. I mean, today. Why would anybody wait? It's like playing Russian roulette with your soul. It's like putting a, a bullet in a chamber of a gun and spinning the gun and pulling the trigger. Every day you're playing Russian roulette with your soul. Give me a good reason why I'm embarrassed. You know the Bible says if we're ashamed of Jesus, one day He'll be ashamed of us. Well, I'm set in my ways. I just don't want to change. Do you know this? Most people get saved when they're children. Many people will get saved in vacation Bible school. Or maybe they'll get saved in camp. Camp is a wonderful, wonderful ministry. Thank God for Christian camps. But let me say this, the older you get without accepting Christ, the odds of you getting saved become slimmer and slimmer and slimmer. As you get set in your ways and you don't want to change, that's why if you're over 50 years old and you're not saved, the odds are you will wind up in hell. That's just the facts. That's the odds. That's why you need to get saved today. Let me say this. The more you put off and the more you say no to Jesus, the harder it'll be for you to be saved tomorrow. There's a thing called sending away your day of grace. God gives you grace today. He says, come to me today. And you say, no, not today. Come to me today. No, not today. Come to me today. No, not today. You say no enough to God, and you'll, God will quit calling. And there'll be no conviction. Sometimes I'll have people call me and they'll say, I'm so scared I've committed the unpardonable sin. I had a man one time come to my office. He was sure he'd committed the unpardonable sin. I said, I'm sure you didn't. He said, how do you know? I said, because if you committed it, you wouldn't even care. But you know, a lot of people don't care. They're not worried about it. No, I ain't worried about it. Because conviction no longer is knocking at their door. They love their sin, and they're not going to give it up. Let me tell this story, and I'll be through. I titled this story, I'm Going to One Day. I got a phone call, I guess 15 years ago or so. It was a lady. It's usually the ladies. She said, Preacher, you don't know me, but someone recommended you to me. And she said, My husband and I are about to get a divorce. He is a heavy drinker, and I just can't take it anymore. But before we divorce, we've agreed to come in if you'll talk to us, and we'd like to get some counseling. 
So they came to my office and sat down and I met with them and I talked with them. I talked with them several times. And sure enough, this man was, was a drunkard. And I tell you, if you've ever dealt with drunkards or an alcoholic, you know it can be very tiring. As they promise, oh, I'll never drink again, and they go off and drink. And then you forgive them and say, okay, let's try again. And they, and they do good for a month or two, and then whammo, they're back drunk. And boy, it just wears you out. And the wife says, I, I don't know how much longer I can take it. I want him out of the house. And I tried to talk with them. Didn't do much good. And I could understand the lady. She, she was tired of it. And he was. He was just a drunk. I tried to get them to come to church. And they didn't come. But one Sunday, guess what? The man by himself, the wife was not there. He came to church. He sat on the very back row. Man, I was so happy to see him in church and I preached and gave the invitation to receive Jesus Christ and he wouldn't. After church, we had a man in our church that was a very godly man, a good Christian man, and he was talking to the guy. And after church, they came up to the front of the church and me and this man and the, and the visitor, the drunkard, began to talk. And this man talked to him about, you need Jesus. Jesus will help you. Jesus can give you victory over the alcohol. And Jesus will help you if you'll come and receive him. And the man said, I'm going to one day. Now why would you wait? Why would you wait? He had a chance. He had an opportunity to get saved. But he said, I will one day. And I'm sure he really meant he would one day. It wasn't but a few days, maybe three days, I get a call from his wife. She said, have you seen my husband? I said, he was at church Sunday, but I hadn't seen him since. She said, why well, haven't seen him? And she said, you know, I told him to leave. But he hadn't called me. We don't know where he is. She said, I'm, I'm going to call the police. And she did. She called the police. and Several more days, and then I get a phone call from her. And she was crying. And she said, they found him. His car had gone off the edge of the cliff up in the mountains. In East Tennessee, there's a lot of mountains. And they found him dead in his car. Apparently, he was drunk drove off the road and they don't know if he died instantly the police officer told me he said I told his wife that he died instantly but we don't know that for sure but I didn't want her to think he suffered long and the wife went through some terrible guilt I remember going to the funeral and even after months afterwards she felt guilt But he thought he was in church just a few days before he died. He had a chance. And he said, one day I will. But let me tell you, that's a trick of the devil. And he died. He probably in hell today. Let's bow for prayer.